right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Overcast podcast. I'm your host, Corey. And I'm Wes. And today we're joined by the incredible Paul Quatron of Warm Drags and OCs. How are you doing, Paul? Good. How are you guys doing? Doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. Good. Too, Is it, did just I... got off work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we just got <laughs> off of work a little while ago. It's different time zones, so we kind of have to, you know... Schedule things accordingly, I guess. Um, did I say the last name right? Quatron? I never yeah. really... Okay, cool. Yeah. Interesting means, last name. It means big four in Italian. But ah. because my my dad's side of the family comes from southern Italy, like in Calabria. So they drop all... The, like, instead of saying manicotti, they'll say like manicot or prosciutto. Mm. So I think other Italians would pronounce it quattrone. But oh, you know, okay. Southern Italy is Quatron. Yeah. We're we're me and Wesley are Hispanic, so we do the cuatro, which is four. That's four also. So yeah. Right, yeah. So, There's a lot of similarities between Italian and, and uh, Spanish. I've heard. I don't speak fluent Spanish, but um my girlfriend speaks fluent Spanish and I envy her. But um <laughs> she yeah, she tells me all the time that there's a lot of similarities with a bunch of different languages. It's pretty crazy. My, I took I took Spanish in high school, and my high school Spanish teacher would be so disappointed in me because I I can barely remember any of it, and I've been to Spain more times than I can count, and Mexico more times than I can count. Yeah, very disappointed in me. I mean, she was even back then, but even more so now. Mm-hmm. I think it's a little more embarrassing for us because we live like practically right on the border of Mexico. <laughs> And so everybody here already speaks Spanish and yeah, I, no. I still almost failed Spanish class. So, <laughs> um, you can always, you can always start over. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I guess. Um, but how you've been doing, how have you been doing? Uh, how has life been treating you recently? It's been going well. We just got back from that Colorado trip, which is pretty incredible yeah. and pretty good to play music again for people. Um, we were practicing for two or three weeks before then. So mm-hmm. I live in Joshua Tree and I was commuting back and forth to LA, just like two hours there, two hours back, but I was actually really enjoying it. Awesome. Um, like, I really like it here, but I'm getting to the point where I'm like, I can, I can go see some other people now. I'm, go for drives like yeah the, um, the isolation is has been cool but i'm i'm pretty i'm over it yeah one of the things i wanted to ask you was besides music of course besides making music because i know the oc's had a pretty big output in 2020 uh so besides all the music and stuff what what kept you busy during quarantine what were you occupying yourself <laughs> I, with i was working on my yard most of the time um I bought this house in August 2019, mm-hmm. which you know was like just a few months before the whole pandemic started. And, and I had it only in, I was living in LA at the time, so I had intended this to just be a place to come visit on the weekends. And once it became, once the reality became like, okay, we're not playing any shows anymore for who knows how long. Um, my girlfriend and I. We had an apartment in LA. We're like, let's just get rid of that and go there, go out to the desert permanently until, you know, spread mm-hmm. this whole thing out there. So yeah, it's been working on my yard. I don't know if you can see. So like all of that. I don't know if you can Whoa. see the cacti and stuff, but yeah, and that that concrete path. I did all of that. All the trees, nice. everything that's not a Joshua tree, I planted and landscaped myself. Mm-hmm. Very, very proud of that. It's like it looks very dead. nice. Thank, yeah. thank you. I used to work for a landscaping company, so I kind of oh. kind of know what I'm doing. Very cool. That's great. Yeah, I've been following that. You've been posting a little bit about it on your Instagram, I guess, throughout your working on it. Yeah. It's been, it's been, it looks really nice. Like the, the scenery is incredible. <laughs> um, there are a few days where I like, where I seriously almost killed myself because like when I was doing all the concrete pavers and stuff, I had a concrete truck come and I kind of, 
underestimated how much work it actually would be. And it was seriously, it was 12 hours straight of just super hard labor <laughs> mm -hmm. in the heat. And yeah, uh, I don't think I've ever worked as hard in one day as I did that day. I'm kind of too old for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I still say like I, I I had a little I still just from like all the digging and like trowing and stuff I like fucked up my elbow a little bit. Mm. Yeah. Well, it looks Many like people. it. It looks like paid the off. hard work paid off. Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. I'm like seriously proud, Dad, about that. Mm. It's the most dad move I've made in a long time. <laughs> Are you still planning on adding more things or you're pretty content with how it is now? Oh yeah. I'm kind of obsessed with cacti. I kind of figured out which ones can thrive out here and which, which ones won't. Um, and cause I, I'll go on like, I'll go on offer up and Craigslist and find people who are just giving away cacti and agaves and even palm trees for free. If you go there and dig them up yourself and yeah. you know, I'll rent a cargo van. I don't have anything better to do. So <laughs> I'll just like, make a day of it. Yeah. Um, I've also seen on your Instagram that you like to bike occasionally. Is that? Yeah. All the time. I, uh, up in the park at Joshua Tree National Park, I have like mm -hmm. a year long park pass. Um, so I meant to go there today, but I got back late last night. Um, it was just been kind of lazy today, but I might go after this, after we finish up here. Very nice. Um, but yeah, I do that. I mean, it's, I love biking, but it's also, I kind of do it to train like an athlete um, because of, you know, we played over two hours the other night and I'm in my forties. So like when I was in my twenties, I didn't have to do shit. I just go up on stage, I could drink 10 beers and just like play like an idiot for yeah. an hour, hour and a half and like it wouldn't even phase me. Now I actually have to, like, I have to work for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd like to, we're definitely going to get into the Red Rocks thing a little later, but I, the reason I bring up the the biking is because a few episodes back when we talked to Tim uh, Hellman, he was saying that he likes to bike also. So I was like, hmm, I wonder if they, have you guys ever biked together somewhere? Or? No, but I saw on Instagram today that Dan and Tim were biking together. I saw that, yeah. Friend Arian. <laughs> Felt a little left out. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't think they would expect me to drive two hours just to go biking yeah. for a half hour or whatever. But I was a little jealous. Just you guys should ride your bikes halfway an hour and an hour and yeah, then. meet in San Bernardino. <laughs> Actually, by the end of the summer, my goal is to ride from here to Big Bear, mm -hmm. which is it's not that far, um, but it would. I kind of want to test it because my ultimate goal is to ride from uh, San Francisco to LA, just taking route one. Mm -hmm. um, that would require some training, some serious training. So I think going up to Big Bear, you have to go over this mountain pass because driving from here, it's like 45 minutes, but you know, biking over a really Jeez. steep mountain pass would be like, that'd be, that'd be a pretty good test for doing San Francisco to LA. Yeah, that's like an all-day affair. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Wait, is it, would you go there and back or just there and no, that's that's all the work? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. It's, it's possible <laughs> by the time I got there, I'd be like, oh, how much is an Uber with a bike rack? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. That's great. Glad to hear that uh, a lot of people, they were kind of... You know, they didn't know what to do with themselves during the quarantine. So it's glad to hear that you kind of had a lot of stuff to occupy yourself with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, especially out here, it's the whole point is being outdoors. So I try to do that as much as I can. That's why we're doing this interview outside. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we can start moving into the, the music aspect of things. Um, yeah, and I'd like the way. The meat and potatoes. Yeah, we can. We had a a little. Uh, we had bread and butter there. That was the bread and butter. <laughs> <laughs> I like. I like it all. Bread and butter, meat and potatoes, nitty gritty. Give it all up. Mash it all <laughs> up. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'd like to start off with uh, warm drag. 
Mm-hmm. Um, big fan of Warm Drag. When when I first discovered it, it was in 2018. I think when you released your debut, right? Was that 2018? I believe. Yeah, yeah, 2018. Yeah, and yeah. I remember during 2018, it was kind of a lot of because I we were primarily psych music listeners at mm-hmm. mostly, um, and not to put anything else down or anybody else down who may make like uh, garage psych music, but a lot of it tends to blend together over time. Um, and I remember when I found out about warm drag, it was just like, Whoa, like this is so like, not, not saying that it was garage psych or anything, but it was just like a completely different sound that was new to me. And it was really, really intriguing. And yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's all, sample based and mm-hmm. I've sampled predominantly old like 50s and 60s rock and roll records um, but I pitch them down and I warp them put them through guitar pedals um, so it's kind of some of it's like kind of recognizable in a way that it you can tell it's a sample and you can tell that it's an old vintage sample but it's like warped enough that it like I wouldn't want to just, I, I, I always don't want to do stuff straight up, you know. Mm-hmm. I had like, it's just my instinct to like fuck it up a little bit. It just sounds better to me that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love DJ Screw, so like pitching stuff down instantly is just has that really druggy quality that I like in music, which you know is like, like DJ Screw to me is super psychedelic. <clears throat> um and so yeah pitching stuff down instantly gives it that like like i just took two big hits of hash <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um but yeah everything's all like chopped up and it's not just old samples of records it's like some noise stuff that i do like i'll spend all day just coming up with noise loops um mm-hmm. and not really labeling anything or cataloging it, just doing it because it's fun. And so I have like this whole library of like all these noise loops that I do mostly when I'm high. And so when I listen to them when I'm sober, I'm like, how if I had no idea what the fuck I was doing? <laughs> yeah. It's really alarming. <laughs> what the fuck was I going on in my head during this one? And a lot of them I don't have any recollection of making. I just, do it i mean it's seriously it's over like four or five years worth of stuff that i just um i don't know if you've seen my setup but it's it's like two Mm -hmm. samplers each sampler has a different array of pedals like a line of pedals yeah um like one sampler is predominantly bass stuff and the other one is like more high-end melodic and noise stuff um but then i run both of them through a mixer so can be combined into like one cohesive sound Mm -hmm. um and so i'll have all these noise loops and just weird atmospheric loops that i make um just on its own without any like without having any purpose to it just doing it because it sounds cool to me and then i'll start sampling all these old records and basically like making a loop or two from an old record or two old records um, and having that going and then like going through the library of noise loops and just kind of just experimenting with it until something sounds really good together. Um, Like you just know instantly when you have two sounds that weren't meant to go together and all of a sudden they just like, like fitting two pieces of a puzzle together it's like a eureka moment and then i build the song from there like add some drum beats um i've actually i've i've been working on stuff here and there over the past mostly over the past year and i started incorporating a kick and snare which like i'm sure for a our live setup is just going to make it even more complicated than it already is <laughs> I don't know if you've seen us play, but I have just this wall of speakers, almost like 
dub sound system style wall of speakers. Mm -hmm. Um, And for two people, for like for two people, one of whom doesn't even play any instruments, it's yeah, it's just a ridiculous amount of gear. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So like adding a kick and snare is. I haven't even told Vashi yet. (laughs) Why? Just surprised. Um, Yeah, but I. It sucks because there's just. I don't have any deadline. We don't have any shows booked, you know, so mm-hmm. I don't have anything to really whip my ass into shape. It'd be nice mm-hmm. to just have someone be like, you need to finish this in three months or I'm going to fine you $2,000. Like, <laughs> all right, I have two in three weeks. So I can, yeah. I can tell you that right now if I can get another warm drag album coming in three months. <laughs> That'll right. fine you $2,000. <laughs> <laughs> Donate it to charity. Yeah. Like, Parody. <laughs> for sure um yeah so how do how do you sort of because the music is so like you said it's just it's real you know a hosh posh of a bunch of different things how do you usually incorporate vocals into that like how does that work process work um i have i'll send Vashti. um Simple loops, like like I said, once I have the noise stuff and the samples of pre-recorded stuff together, where it sounds like okay, I can I can hear what the general vibe of this song is going to be. Mm-hmm. I'll send her stuff to just kind of improvise over. Like she'll she'll send me back recordings of her singing over it without any lyrics. Sometimes she's humming. Sometimes she's just like singing gibberish but it's like melodies that start coming to her head and we basically just keep chipping it chipping away at it and kind of like sculpting it but oh i like that thing that she did here it gives me an idea for like another part and then maybe i'll come up with like a bridge that's like Mm -hmm. something totally out of left field yeah a lot of just like emailing tracks back and forth because she's actually living in tucson right now oh man yeah. Um, so we don't get together as much as I would like, but I have a loose plan to go out there sometime within the next month. Um, cause we, what we used to do is like basically the same process, but instead of just emailing each other tracks, we just set up a microphone and record ourselves in the same room doing the mm-hmm. same thing. She would improvise. And then it was a lot more organic that way because I could react to something on the fly and like, oh, I can like introduce this sample right here. Yeah. Never mind this part, you know. Um, so yeah, it's a little slow going, but we're we're getting there. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's it's great stuff. Um, does that is there like a preference that you have? I'm I'm sure it's a challenge doing both. Like, like you said, it was kind of. It could be a process coming up with a song, um, the way that you're going about it, with like finding the different samples and stuff that work together. Um, so, is there like a difference or a preference that you have if it would be, you know, creating more stuff or just playing that stuff live? Well, yeah, I mean, everything everything that we write is meant to be performed live. You know, like with like I don't want to come up with something that we wouldn't be able to pull off live because that's a trap you can get into with samplers and um, working with electronics and, you know, recording onto Ableton like I do. Like you could just layer shit indefinitely mm-hmm. and, you know, write a whole fucking symphony if you want to. But like, I still want to be able to play as much stuff live as I possibly can. Like I could just program everything and hit play and then just like mime you know, doing everything <laughs> yeah. like a lot of DJs do. Um, and, and that's, that's fine. You know, like I've seen, I've played enough festivals to have like watch some of these DJs from the side of the stage. And I can just tell like, Oh, they're just hit play and they're just pretending to like tweak the knobs or maybe they're tweaking some filter knobs here and there, but they already know where this song is going. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's like, that shit 
is mastered already and it's like being pumped through a sound system and you look out in the crowd and people are going ape shit. So, you know, I can't like, like the old school musician in me sees that and be like, Oh, they're fucking faking it. But it doesn't matter. You know, like <laughs> what matters is, are you rocking the crowd or not? And like, I, so I can't really knock, knock people for doing that as long as it moves the crowd. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not how I personally want to do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I smiled a little when you said that you don't want to do something that you can't play live and then you're like well i'm still kind of thinking of how to work in kick and snare <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing like the, uh, we did all the touring that we did in 2019 which was like a lot that was a kind of crazy year for me because i was literally just like going back and forth between oc's tour and warm drag tour like i'd be home for four days and not even have a day to rest, just instantly like go to practice and then practice for three days and then like pack everything up and fly over back to Europe. Um, and, but we did, we did this tour um, with a band called Fontaine's DC. Do you know those guys? They're Irish I don't band. Think so. mm-hmm. They're really good. Um, and they were kind of blowing up. Or not even kind of they are blowing up so we did these shows with them they were like biggest shows we've ever played you know like really big rooms with really big sound systems and it was kind of like you know because we're used to playing some punk shows with like that's why i have my pa speakers because if we show up to a place to play a show and all they have is just a shitty little like two speaker pa then we're fucked because i can't you know i need that shit to be loud yeah uh and so yeah playing in these big rooms with big pa systems i could kind of hear like the full potential of everything but also opening up for a band with live instrumentation live drums it's like i really i felt kind of like kind of naked on stage and i could kind of sense people in the crowd like wanting something just like i think we did all right People seemed into it, but I could tell people just wanted that extra, like, "Mm," you know, like if I just had a kick and snare, do my thing with like my left, my left hand, my right foot, my right hand doing all the sampler stuff. And, um, I think that that could make it like a little more bombastic, but yeah, it's going to take a little practice on my end. Yeah. I feel like that'd be really entertaining to watch too. (laughs) <laughs> just kind of totally, yeah and visually instead of me just yeah. like sitting there looking like i'm checking my email or something <laughs> well yeah i've seen some of the the live clips um on youtube um and it sounded pretty badass <laughs> like I, I would it's really cool <laughs> thanks yeah if you see it's live it's like it's it's loud <laughs> i've dialed it down a little bit we've um like there, <laughs> there was one show we played in LA. Is that this like stupid bowling alley in Highland Park? And like the owner kept complaining because we were too loud, and so he sent the sound guy to like try and get me to turn it down while we were playing. And he was like, "I tune it like no matter if I'm playing drums or if I'm doing that band, especially that band because I have a million things going on. I kind of just tune everything out. So all of a sudden, I just saw this hand." like come up because he was trying to get my attention and I just saw his hand like in front of my samplers and stuff and I just like had to swat it <laughs> and Wire was there he's like that was the coolest fucking thing I've ever seen you do man <laughs> uh, and then the guy just left me alone he's like you know what I'm not even gonna bother leave it <laughs> but, uh, but yeah I've kind of I'm I'm honestly kind of going deaf partially I have constant ringing in my ear so sometimes i don't even realize it's as loud as it is um so i have to kind of rely on boshi to be like it's a bit much right now (laughs) um but yeah basically if you if you come see us it'll be like you will you will feel the sound waves blowing Mm -hmm. over your face cool well i'd like you I'd like you to play live shows in four months or I'll find you another $2,000. <laughs> That's not up to me. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. To, I don't know who whoever makes the rules. Although I just saw they're opening up 
they're like lifting the mask mandate. Yeah, yeah for people oh, who've gotten yeah. vaccinated. Are you, are you guys in California? No, we're in Texas. We're in Texas. Oh, okay. We're in Texas. Uh, like deep south Texas. Yeah, um, like, like I said earlier, we're like right by the border. Um, South San border. Antonio's like what three and a four half hours, hours away. Four four hours north. Oh, cool. yeah. like near Galveston? No, further um, south. <laughs> hey, where's Galveston? Galveston is Galveston. more like north. by Houston. Yeah, it's more north than San Antonio. Um, oh, I've, do you know where? Is the, what's like the southernmost town? Yeah, so Corpus Christi is like two hours away from us still. Okay, um, so you're so, like the last stop before. Yep. Mexico. We're we're three cities before Mexico, yeah. Cool. Three small cities. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's why I say it's pretty embarrassing. We don't know Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really have no excuse. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm sure Texas being Texas will probably lift their mask mandate sooner than that if they haven't have they I already think they did that. I like, think they already a couple months ago. Yeah. <laughs> they did it, I oh, think. Yeah, they uh, did last March. March. Like, yeah, like in the middle of the pandemic, they're like, ah, fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Until yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm fully vaccinated, thankfully. So yeah. I'm still wearing my mask, but, uh, I do too. I, I stopped wearing it outside. Um, which like, I got a lot of shit when we did those live streams because some of the guys were wearing them and some weren't. And I was like, we're outside and there's, <laughs> Like we were already practicing in like an indoor practice room without masks. Actually, no, some people were wearing masks, but like it. I I felt like if it if it's outside and you're not around a large group of people, I thought it was fine. But um, if I'm around like strangers, you know, if I'm like um, walking down a crowded street, I wear a mask outside. Like if I go to Palm Springs. Uh, mm-hmm. But definitely always inside. In fact, yeah. when I was in Colorado, I went to this restaurant and like everybody who worked there, including the host, weren't wearing masks. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm taking this off. And it was the first time I didn't wear a mask inside for over a year. It felt That's really scary. weird. <laughs> yeah, it was. But I'm fully vaccinated, so I didn't really... Like I guess we're doing this. Are you a Pfizer or Moderna gang or J and J? It was Moderna, and it kind of fucked me up both times. <laughs> really? Both shots, yeah. I like not the day of, but the day after. Like I don't really ever get sick, and yeah, I had like it was like mild fever, all sore, achy. Yeah, I I got the, I got the the Pfizer and I it was just a sore arm for both shots. Thank you. Yeah, but that's, that's <laughs> well, I also you got, got the Pfizer. Good one. Um, I, I didn't really feel much the first time; just my arm was sore. But the second time, like not the day of, the next day, I woke up and I was like, "What the fuck?" It felt. It reminded me of when I had strep throat back in seventh grade. Like I didn't want to get up exactly. or do anything. I just yeah. like w- laid in bed. I have my my monitor set up right here and my bed back there. I was like, fuck going up to my desk. I set up like a virtual keyboard and was just watching YouTube videos all day. <laughs> Dude, this is seriously my grandparents whenever they would have stories when they would talk about the depression. Um, I feel like this is gonna be the same thing for us in like twenty or thirty years. We're gonna be talking about the effects we had from the vaccinations and like you know. Yeah, like not playing. I didn't play shows for a, a year and four months. <laughs> Dang, that's crazy to think about. But it, it's. I think it's even crazier now that we're kind of we're exiting that tunnel slowly. You know, like it's starting to be like I can ask people like, "What were you doing during quarantine?" Like it's it passed yeah. already. You know. Yeah. No, everything is it's looking very promising. You know, we have. We have some shows. We have tours booked in September and November. And I'm actually feeling pretty hopeful about it. It seems like it's actually going to happen. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Um, so something I wanted to actually um, kind of mention 
Uh, Corey showed me a warm drag maybe about a year or two ago. And it was like just after I went on this Twin Peaks tangent. I watched like uh-huh. all of it. Um, in the movie Fire Walk With Me, I don't know if you've seen it or not. There's this one song called The Pink Room. And oh, when yeah. I listened, yeah. So you know yeah. exactly what I'm talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, I, that's really a vibe we're, we're going after for sure. So uh, if I ever see you guys live, like, that's exactly what I want to do. When you said um, <laughs> you'll be able to feel the sound waves. That's, that's uh, honestly that's kind of that was one of the first things Vashi and I connected over was that she told me I was a fan of her older band called mm-hmm. K-Hole and she said that their whole mission as a band was to sound like that song The Pink Room so I was like uh, alright uh, we're gonna do this we're <laughs> gonna yeah, check them out it. too <laughs> yeah they were great it's really funny that you said that because before this, Wesley was like, I don't know how to bring it up. Like, I don't know if he's ever even heard of that movie or that song or anything. I'm like, just do it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> have you have you ever heard David Lynch's music? I, I've heard a little bit of it and it's it's a – I don't know how to say it. Like, it, it, it bobs, but you have to, like, be very open-minded for it to bop, you know? It's a yeah, lot I like mean, his, his films in a way. Right. And he has a very, very distinctive – nasally voice yeah. but like i find it endearing and um but i knowing his movies and knowing the kind of music that he's into i can see where he's drawing his influences from but also you could tell like at least with the two albums that i'm familiar with i don't know if i think he just has two albums he might have more but but two albums that i know of it's like oh he's definitely going for like a suicide type thing too so they're actually they're pretty cool but it's um i think it's mostly live instrumentation there might there's a few with some electronic drum beats mm-hmm. um but yeah you should check it out i definitely will so yeah that's that's cool um cory um yeah well of course one of the the key things that happened recently was like you mentioned earlier back into live shows mm-hmm. and uh i mean what better you know venue to come back to than red rocks um, yeah so what was that like i mean like what was what was the the build up to that like going back into playing live shows after so long well we caught we found out about it um we got this offer only like a month and a half ago which for a show on that scale is kind of last minute um but so there wasn't really a lot of build up to it it was more like okay we're doing this just all right let's right back two weeks yeah we just jumped right into it um so we came up with a set list which we normally don't do usually when we play shows we don't write a set list at all john just calls out the songs um but we kind of figured it wasn't going to be a normal show like there weren't going to be a mass of people crowded in front of the stage, people jumping on each other and crowd surfing and watching. I figure people would mostly just kind of be like confined to their own area so we could get away with doing some stuff that we might not otherwise be able to do. Um, like some of the more like proggy type songs um, where it's like, like if we do some jammy stuff. I've noticed I was actually... T- I had, a, I, a, I had like three friends from high school come to the show who were all like very big into the Grateful Dead and like the whole kind of like jam scene. And, and they were into it. They were totally blown away. Um, and they were looking around like kind of blown away at the crowd itself because just because of how like it wasn't really one type of person there. You know, they're like, like the skate punk type kids or like the jam band kids or old gray haired, gray bearded dudes who saw Hawkland back in like 1973, you know? Yeah. Um, and then like, and just all kinds of random people, but I saw them when we normally play a show, it's pretty cool. Cause when we do the, the fast, heavy stuff, other like skate punk kids who go crazy and like crowd surf and mosh. And then when we start to like, 
do some more jammier stuff. You can tell like the kids were from like the jam scene who might even be tripping on mushrooms or acid. That's when they start getting like really keyed into the set. You can like sense the shift going back and forth throughout the set. It's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, I- yeah. The show itself was, it was fucking great. It felt really good. We were all kind of nervous. Um, but then by like the third song, we settled into it. And it was a lot of fun. The crowd was great. I mean, have you ever been to Red Rocks? I haven't, but I'm going this year sometime in oh, cool. October. You're gonna have the best. You're gonna have the best time. Because um, even just going there, I we actually played there a few years ago, opening up for another band, and I went back the next day. It was just empty and like hiked around. Um, even just going there to an empty venue, it's incredible. Um, yeah. Then it was like a lifelong dream to play there, being. Grateful Dead fan, um, and I like hung out with my buddies in the parking lot before the show, which is also kind of a dream come true. Just to like tailgate in the lot <laughs> for like your own show, it was that was pretty cool. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Yeah, y- yeah, I've seen some photos, and I'm really stoked to go because it just looks beautiful out there. Yeah, you're and- gonna have the best time. Yeah. Another thing that I thought was beautiful was a lot of people, I saw photos circulating of the set list that you guys played. (laughs) And I was incredibly jealous to say the least. Um, You guys played some, some deep cuts on that. Yeah. Um, So how, what, like, what was that? What was that like planning the set list was, uh, I, you had kind of touched on it, how like it would be, more so like there's no really there's not really moshing or anything so you guys can open up to more of your discography but exactly, uh, yeah. yeah so what was going into choosing the songs um part of it came out of so we had actually planned on doing um the fourth and final live stream um john had this location in downtown la that he didn't tell us he's like i just want you to be surprised when you see it um we were supposed to do that on April 24th. Um, so we had kind of come up with a set for that and it was going to be more on like the proggy side of things. And then the, we got this offer for the Red Rock show. And so he was like, let's just not do this live stream thing. Let's just focus on that. But I think because we had kind of already started listening to the set list that he gave us for that, which had more of the proggy stuff, we I think he incorporated some of that into this Red Rock set. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there were a few songs. I was like, I, you know what? I'm going to bring a gong. Because, um, <laughs> you know, that song, Scudam and Scorpius. Yeah. It's a really long passage where there's no drums, just all cymbal washes. Mm-hmm. And it's really, I mean, it's like maybe the proggiest song I've ever played on. And I, I don't know why I didn't use a gong on the recording. And I guess it just didn't occur to me, but I was like, yeah, I have to playing this song at Red Rocks. Like, even if I just use it for this one song, I'll do it. So I did. And <laughs> it perfect. It looked really cool. I don't think it's going to be a regular thing because I just, we don't have the room for it. Mm-hmm. But maybe if we play Rod, Red Rocks again, I'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> I've been I've been watching a bunch all the live streams that you guys have put out and that's one thing that I've really really enjoyed is seeing like the the choice cuts from like previous albums that I never would have thought that you guys would play live. Um and I was just wondering is that something that was just cuz it was kind of remote and the Red Rocks thing was kind of stationary stuff or do you think there's a possibility that you'll work that into future set lists at regular shows again or I'm not sure. Um, I we haven't really talked about it. Um, I mean, in this recent set list that we just did, he picked a few songs that we did from the live streams that we had never played before. So maybe once we start playing again regularly, it'll be a thing. I was, I mean, I'm hoping we can we can vary the set lists a lot more than we normally do if we just have this huge canon of songs to choose from. 
That would be really cool. It would take a little more work and a little more practice, but I, we can absolutely do it. Um, but it it also depends. I mean, we we don't travel with roadies or crew. We have a sound guy who also sells merch, <laughs> which is insane. It's like unheard of. Um, but it's really, it's just the five of us and him when we tour in a sprinter van. So we're already working pretty hard. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, obviously the music should always come first, but there are other things to factor in too, you know? Um, yeah. But who knows, you know, I, we have, like I said, we haven't talked about it, but I would love to do that. I'd love to, every single song that we learned for those live streams and for this set that we hadn't played before, I was, I'm hoping we can play again at some point. Yeah. And there's not exactly a shortage on back catalog OC songs. Yeah. So. <laughs> and there's other, yeah. And there's like dozens and dozens of other songs that we still have yet to play that I would love to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially like a lot of the stuff from the albums that you guys put out on 2020 in 2020. Mm-hmm. That's really cool stuff. Yeah. A lot of those we've never played. Mm-hmm be down any requests i'm really glad you asked that because <laughs> i've seen it idea? i've seen it um oh, it's just like it's a dream of mine so my favorite oc song of all time is on weird exits and it's um <clears throat> oh sorry oh sorry okay. i have to drink some water I'm getting a little choked up talking about my favorite song. (laughs) (laughs) Somebody cutting onions in here. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) But it is uh, The Axis. It's a great, yeah, and pretty pretty song. Yeah, that's, um, I've seen a lot of people, because when you guys were announcing, I think it was, um, the Big Sur show was the second live stream you did after the Levitation one. Right. And then, so they're like, oh man, they kind of, you know, surprised us with this set list and then they're coming out with the new one. So everybody's like, oh, please, you know, um, the Axis should like be a closer or something. Um, but it didn't happen. And not to say it was disappointing or anything, but it wasn't disappointing at all. Like those, <laughs> those shows are great. <laughs> but it's just like, that's, like one of my dream songs to see. And I don't I I see how it's kind of, you know, it wouldn't necessarily make the cut for like the live shows. <laughs> but uh, you know, maybe one day, who knows. <laughs> well, we always have a point in the set where we play a slower or quiet song, um mostly to give Dan and I a breather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously, that's that's why we always play Sticky Hulk. So it's like our our oh, chance yeah. to just like catch our breath. Um, yeah. But yeah, I could totally see that being that song, you know, that kind of song. Yeah, um, that'd be incredible. <laughs> um, yeah, I've seen... No, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, I've seen you guys four times, I think. Uh, Wesley's was once, I think. Yeah, it was once. Um, but we actually saw you guys for the first time together. Um, that was the first time both of us had seen you guys. And my God almighty, each time is just insane. Like, <laughs> was it in Texas? Yeah, yeah it, was it was in Texas, Austin. in Austin. Yeah, and cool. I, I really love that you guys seem to really love Austin um, because I love seeing you guys, so it works out great. Um, but yeah, it was at the Barracuda RIP. Right, um, right. But yeah, you guys are phenomenal live. And one of the things that I really wanted to ask was you and Dan, like how do how does how does that work out with with two drummers? And it doesn't really seem like you guys are necessarily playing the same the same part exactly. Like I see sometimes you're on riot and he's on the hi-hats and stuff. Mm. And sometimes it even seems like you guys are playing different patterns. So like does it is there somebody who takes a lead on specific songs or how do you guys kind of subdivide yeah, that? We, we kind of switch it up. Um, my favorite beats that we play are the ones where we're playing two completely different things. That's when I think it works best. Um, and obviously we play a lot of older songs that were written when they only had one drummer. So 
Mm -hmm. um, most of those songs, we just stick to playing the same beat because it's just how it was written. And to add more rhythm to it would fuck up the song, generally. I'm trying to think if there's anything that we do. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. But um, yeah, for the most part, we played the same beat on the older stuff. But when we write new parts, um, we try to keep it like where the two of us are playing something completely different, unless it's something like, like that song Golu, where it's just a straight ahead, like yeah, fast punishing motorhead sounding like punk song. Mm -hmm. um, there's not, there's not a lot of room to like do some polyrhythms on a song like that. <laughs> you know? yeah. want to keep it just fast and dumb. But then um, there's a song on Metamorphose, the first song, um, what's it called? The one with the French name, Sagnant. Oh, yeah, I yeah. I'm pronouncing it right. Um, but we actually, you can't really hear it because the recording's really blown out, but we're playing like two different things on that. He's playing like a blast beat and, um, and I'm doing something like, I'm playing kind of a blast beat but it's when you hear it on the recording it just sounds like one mm -hmm. you know complete drum pattern yeah um but yeah a lot of times because i have like a recording set up i have some nice mics and um and i just i can i have a, a spare room in my house where i can just set up and like record drums so a lot of times I'll record myself playing beats and send them to John um, to write riffs to. Mm -hmm. And then when we jam on them in the practice space, Dan will come up with like his part. Or I sometimes will do, I'll record a beat and then record myself playing on top of that beat and then send that to John. And then if it's like, if it sounds cool, then Dan will play that beat. Or sometimes Dan will come to the practice space with a beat and then I'll like come up with my own pattern, you know, or it'll be where a lot of times we show up uh, when we're in the writing process. Um, we jam like five days a week for like three, four hours a day, just like it's a job. Yeah. And so there's a lot of jamming. And so a lot of times we just come up with stuff on the spot or Dan and I are playing different patterns and you know, John records everything. We go back and listen to the jams and pick parts, parts that are like really clicking. Mm -hmm. And then we go in the next day and he'll play us like a minute clip from this jam from the day before. He's like, let's just, let's just jam on this part some more. And then kind of like sculpt that into a song. So yeah, Very it depends cool. on the song. But, yeah. But yeah, we, we try to keep it where we're playing different stuff mm -hmm. that Sometimes he takes the lead. Sometimes I take the lead. Um, and we try not to step on each other's toes. Yeah. One thing that um, we had Enrique on a few episodes back also. And one thing that we were talking to him about is um, that I brought up. And I feel like it's very appropriate to bring it up to you too. Is that one of my favorite OC's drum things or like drum segments is the ending of Raw Optics. Like that whole thing just blew my mind the first th the first time I listened to it, and it still does. Um, and he was talking about like yeah how he gets a lot of compliments on um, the sound the drum sound of Orc, and but he's kind of like he says he was learning things on Orc, but he kind of perfected it on Smoke Reverser um, in terms of sounds and stuff. And I get um, I talk to other people who listen to your music and they're like, oh yeah, you know, the sound on the drum sound on like Protean Threat sounds really cool. And uh, yeah. I was just wondering like, how do you, how do you come up with the drum sounds that you want for a specific album? Is it, does that like a conscious thing or it just ends up sounding like that in post or? It's it, a lot of it has to do with the way they mic it. And like John and I have very, um, very similar tastes and drum sounds. Um, you know, like we both, he sends me music almost every, in fact, while we were talking, he just sent me a Discogs link to some 
I don't know who it is. Um, but uh, yeah, like he and I really see eye to eye on on good drum sounds. And I think what works best for this band, since we have two drummers, is to not use a lot of room mic. I don't know mm-hmm. if Enrique talked about that, but um, you know, we did this thing where we put a blanket over the kick drum, both kick drums, um, and just get it like kick drum really punchy, the snare like really cracking but not boxy. Like I hate that '90s drum sound that like gated snare that like Steve Albini sound. I fucking hate that shit. Um, and so like that kind of like blown out, blown out. Like my favorite drum sounds are the ones from like really shitty like 60s, late 60s, early 70s R&B and funk records where they have drum breaks where it's just, it's recorded so crudely and it's kind of blown out, but it just like sounds so sweet. Um, so yeah, like John, I think by uh, Protein Threat, he like really perfected that drum sound. Um, you know, like, and they're all, all four of those albums are recorded at the Sonic Ranch with Enrique, like with the same crew, same, and we use, we use the same drum sets, um, all four albums. So it was really cool. It was, it was like, okay, here's what worked for the last recording. Here's what we can maybe try and improve. So in my mind, when I hear those albums, I hear the drum sound just getting better and better and better and like closer to what we really want it to sound like. And I, I mean, they all sound good to me, but I really think the last one, they totally nailed it. Um, nice. Oh, actually, the other thing too, this most recent album, I use um, instead of a regular kick drum, I used uh, a floor tom for a kick drum. Mm. John made this um, contraption that basically, like you know, because the floor tom doesn't have any like legs on the side, it was just a regular floor tom. Mm-hmm. So he made this wooden contraption where it just like kept the floor tom in place, you know, when like, the kick drum was hitting it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was like, it was really cool because sonically it's different enough from the regular kick drum that Dan was playing that we could like use them both and they don't really step on each other's toes. Mm-hmm. For me, it was fucking great because there were a lot of really kind of funky syncopated beats that I was playing on that album that, um, like when you're, when you're playing more like, groove based stuff like funk you know funky bouncy beats mm-hmm. um you don't want to be hitting as hard as you possibly can because you kind of like you want to be behind the beat instead of ahead like if you're playing really fast like punk beats you want to like be ahead of the beat it mm-hmm. sounds good it sounds driving but like when you're playing like in the cut playing like a kind of bouncy beat you want to be a little bit behind just otherwise you sound like red hot chili peppers some shit you know what i mean like <laughs> it really is like somebody like john bonham can play really funky and heavy because his drums are just so loud that he doesn't have to really hit that hard he used really big sticks and you watch him and he's like barely hitting but his sound is massive um and so yeah having for whatever reason the way that that floor tom is the kick drum worked it made it so that i didn't have to hit it's hard to be able to hear it and to feel it. It's just like, it just made me play better. I feel. Mm -hmm. Um, And it sounded really cool in the recording too. Yeah. One of the cool things that I liked on a, on Protean Threat was the, I think it was, I forgot what song it was, but it sounded like you were playing like a trigger thing and it was like doing like this sound and it sounded really cool. Um, yeah, that was, um, so one of those beats that I sent John to riff over, um, I had taken, um, I took a beat that I was playing just like kind of a Kraut Rocky beat. I looped it. Um, and then Ableton does this really cool thing where you can take an acoustic drum beat, uh, excuse me, drum beat or sample um and you can convert it into a midi file and so i took this loop of myself playing um and then made like 
a MIDI drum beat out of it. And then you can like kind of basically make like an electronic drum beat out of based off of the, the acoustic drum beat. Mm-hmm. And so I had this like electronic beat going that was like the same exact pattern. And, and then I just put it through all these effects and it had that like, you know? Yeah. Um, and it sounded really cool. And then I actually, and then I played on top of that and sent that to him. And then, so that's how he wrote that song. But instead of, cause we, he didn't want to like just play to a loop. Yeah. So he was like, let's try and replicate this. And he had this, oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's like a space drum, I think. But you hook, so I had a trigger taped to um, my kick drum that he hooked up to this pedal. So anytime I hit the kick drum, it would trigger the pedal. So we kind of recreated the loop that I made, um, mm-hmm. you know, in real time. So that's why, like, every time I hit the kick drum, you hear that it, like, cancels itself out. Yeah. Because the sample is just like, yeah. But if I'm playing it busy, it's like, you know. Yeah. You can actually hear it at the very, very end. You can hear the whole sample at the very end when I do the last kick drum hit. Yeah. I heard that on the, when you guys were rehearsing that album, when you released that oh, video. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. use it for that. We use it for that session, that live mm-hmm. session too. Yeah. Yeah. It was really cool stuff. Um, well, I would like to introduce a new segment that we've never done on the show before. And yeah. who better to try it on? than you um you're gonna have to we're gonna send you over a pool of shaving cream and you're gonna jump into it <laughs> all right <laughs> now um it's a listener submitted <laughs> it's a listener submitted questions um we asked okay. uh, on instagram we announced that we were going to be talking to you this week and asked if people had any questions to ask you to uh, go ahead and send them in and um Surprisingly, uh, well, I guess not surprisingly, because you're uh, you're who you are. I got a lot of questions more than I was expecting, so okay. I apologize to anybody whose question I don't read. There was a lot of them, but um, this is going to be a reoccurring thing, so it's going to happen every week. So you guys keep on sending questions in, and one day it'll be asked on the show. But uh, here we go. It's just going to be kind of like a not really a rapid thing. Take your time answering it, but it's going to just go, you know, we're going to go through the list. It's just a few, but yeah, um, here we go. This is from beatnik underscore Brad. It's a few <laughs> questions in one. So it's, uh, <laughs> it says drumming routine, warm ups question mark, inspo question mark, and uh, who leads Paul or Dan and the writing process of drum parts. So if you need um, me to repeat any of those, just go ahead and ask, well, but. The last two we just talked about. Yeah. Um, my warm up routine is basically what I'm doing right now, mostly just stretching. Um, it's like I said, doing all this landscaping, I like kind of fucked up my elbow. But also, um, it's like playing this kind of music, it's really important to stretch for like a good 20 or 30 minutes. I wish I had a, you know what? I have a piece of wood. I don't have a drumstick out here, but I'll show you this thing that I do. This one stretch that I always do before every show that really, really helps. If you have a drumstick like this, you take two hands, go like this. You just kind of twist it around like Mm. that. Oh my God. It feels so good. (laughs) Um, Yeah. It's uh, it's all stretching right before a show. I'll like stretch my back a little bit because, I mean, it's it's just as much sports as it is music for me. Mm-hmm. Like, seriously, like I like I said, I that's why I ride my bike all the time. It's like training for it. Um, so that's my routine. Shit, what were the other? <laughs> uh, some warm ups and uh, some inspos. Um, warm ups. I mostly I don't practice rudiments as much as I should. Um, because I actually have been like the quieter we play live, like when we jam and we kind of go into more like quieter parts, I find myself doing more like rudiment stuff instead of like 
all the single stroke rolls that um like when you play really loud rudiments you don't even really like you can't hear them you know mm -hmm. so it's a lot of like really fast single stroke type stuff um so i mostly like when i practice at home on my own i'm just i'll try and come up with um new beats or like fills within those beats i'll try and come up with like complicated fills that i might be able to kind of replicate when we play live mm -hmm. um inspo i always come back to i say like jackie leapzite from can nice um you know the obvious like john bonham keith moon um rat scabies from the damned um greg erico from slime family stone um who else jack de jeanette played with miles davis played with everybody um billy Cobham. who else those are just off the top of my head that's cool i could, I could um, go sure but yeah the list is endless i'm sure yeah. <laughs> um next one is from pj pilgrim it is, what are your three personal favorite OCs tracks you're featured on and three favorite that you're not? It's a good question. Um, I would say <laughs> three that I played on. Um, I would say Upbeat Ritual, because you can really hear, like I was talking about the what I was talking about with the, um, that floor Tom is the kick drum. Yeah. So like you can really hear it on that song. Actually upbeat ritual into red study. Cause those were written to kind of just, it's like, uh, when if you, you listen to classic rock radio and they play Zeppelin heartbreaker, they always go into living, love and made yeah. just a few songs that just have to go together. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, I don't know if that counts as one or two, but, but those two for sure. Um, uh, what else? Um, Jettison and what's something off of something off the of smoke? Um, is there an album I forget? Jettison's on Oric, right? Yeah, and then. Oh, actually, you know what? Henschlock. Oh, yeah. I thought that was, thought that was a good jam that we captured mm -hmm. live in the studio. And then three that I'm not on. Um, I would say, is it Lu Lupine or Lupine? Yeah. Dominus. Uh, yeah. That, Webb, and Palace Doctor. Because I, I've Nick Murray is like one of my favorite drummers. I love the way he plays drums. Yeah, we're actually talking to him next week too. Really? Yeah. Good dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, this is another three. We're kind of fucking zoom. We're running out of time again. So I don't know if you... I'll try to some as fast as I can. Okay, here we go. Um, here's another three. It's the top three hardest OC songs to play. So the hardest ones to huh. play. Okay, the hardest one is definitely Senti and Una. Mm -hmm. um that one's the hardest animated violence is physically demanding for both of us um and it used to be when we played contraption that would be pretty pretty tough just because it's like we're just fucking go on forever we did it 20 <laughs> minutes one time yeah and i thought i was gonna die but you know, you just keep going and like you find, you find that like reserve inside of you somehow it keeps you going. Mm -hmm. Um, that was by Velvet Starlings, by the way. Um, another one is Will Harrison. Is there going to be an official release of the Red Rocks recording at any point? I don't know. Um. 
whenever, uh, unbeknownst to us, John recorded um, a show at the chapel on our last, the last fall tour, U.S. tour we did. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and he didn't tell us before, so, which is smart because, you know, if you think, if you go into a show knowing it's going to be recorded for a live album, it just adds all this extra pressure, so... They may, they might have recorded it. I have no idea if they did or not. I would, it would be cool though. I thought we did it all right. Yeah. Um, and last one, really, really quick. Um, this is from Elias Rogland. Rogland, sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Is there any deep cuts that you still want to play? Um, you know what? I met this kid at the airport last night who recognized me from the show. And he was asking me if we would ever play No Spell. And I, yeah, that would be my choice too. I was like, that's a really good call. I would love to play that. Um, but who knows? You know, John, I, John picked some really cool songs that really surprised us for those live streams and for the Red Rock show. So, you know, I feel like anything's fair game at this point. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that guy because he was, he posted something on Reddit. And uh, I told him that I was talking to you today. And then he's like, oh, tell him I said a uh, guy in Grateful Shirt, Grateful Dead shirt from airport says what's up. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, there's yeah, your... Talk about the Grateful Dead a lot. He's tall. He's a big dude. <laughs> yeah, nice, I saw him by the nice picture. Kid. Nice kid. He, uh, his mom was picking him up and he like went out and grabbed a marker so I could sign his... He got a Red Rocks hat. Oh, nice. Sweet moment. Very nice. Well, there's your shout out, uh, Grateful Dead shirt guy. Um, <laughs> What's up, dude? <laughs> Brett. I think his name is Brett. Yeah, I think so. I think that's what his username said. But um, that's all the time we have for you today, man. Thank you so much for for My pleasure. for coming on. It was such a great time talking to you. Yeah, likewise. Um, Tell Nick I said what's up. We will. We will for sure. Um, I think we're also talking to Matt Jones next week, also. Oh, cool. But uh, we're cool still fan. figuring things out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we're still waiting on. I'm still in talks with uh, Tom, also. Oh, cool. So, trying to get everyone. Uh, you know, maybe we'll work up to John one day. <laughs> he's been doing a lot of. I've noticed he's been doing a lot of uh, podcast type interviews. So, yeah, I'll go ahead and him. I'll shoot him an email cool. or something. But yeah. um, yeah, thanks so much for being here. Um, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed. And uh, yeah, take care, Paul. Have a have a great rest of your day. Likewise. See you in Texas. Yep. Hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs>